Bill Team to raise their right hand and tell us where he went. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God? Yes, it is. And Tim, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and present our 2019 uh, hospital budget. Um, my name is Timothy Ford. I'm the Chief Executive Officer. Uh, with me on my right is Scott Whittemore, who's the Chief Financial Officer. To my immediate left is Bob Parco, who's the Chief Quality Officer, and also does our uh, information systems work. Um, and Joshua Dufresne, on the far left, is our Chief of Practice Operations. Um, the system is, is a little bit different uh, than most hospitals. We are uh, technically a, an FQHC, a fairly qualified health center. That is our parent organization. Uh, the hospital is a great classes hospital uh, that is a subsidiary of that FQHC. Uh, we made that change back in 2009, I believe, it was before I came. Um, so we, we went first in the state to do that uh, model. I think since Tim Gifford has uh, also changed to that model. And you know, we saw that at that time that we were moving to kind of where we are today with, a, with an ACO type setup, the integration of primary care, the primacy of primary care and the importance to reducing costs, providing better care, chronic disease management, care management, all those things we're talking about today has moved to that model uh, back in 2009. So we feel like, you know, finally, maybe things are going to catch up to where uh, our vision was you know, back then. And you know, we're kind of hoping that financially it catches up as well. Because we have, at times I felt like we're not only on the cutting edge as an organization, maybe on the bleeding edge. Um, we have nine locations in our FQHC, um, including two dental practices, one in Ludlow and in uh, Chester, Vermont, in Northern End and Southern End. We have one uh, vision uh, provider, an ophthalmology practice. Um, we serve six different communities, not just Springfield. Uh, we also uh, have clinics in Londonderry, uh, Chester, Ludlow, Rockingham, and also Charlestown, New Hampshire which in the past year, year and a half, we built a new facility uh, partially through grant funding and local donations. Uh, so it didn't, didn't cost the, the organization, the FQHC, a lot of dollars out of, out of its own pocket. Um, and we've seen some increase in you know, the of services there to that, that community. Our service area is primarily Windsor County. We do, of course, down in Rockingham, get into the Windham County area. And we also serve with the London Dairy Clinic now, of course, with the Bennington and Rutland counties, also with the Ludlow Clinic that gets a little bit into Rutland counties. And we do serve parts of uh, Solon and Cheshire counties in New Hampshire. So we do our two state organization, uh, two different uh, laws, multiple payers. Um, we are, I guess, the first, uh, one of the first FQHCs, or only FQHCs, and uh, critical access hospitals to join uh, all three payers in the one care venture. We did that uh, this past year, in 2018. So, you know, a lot of folks are, are kind of looking at how we're doing uh, with that model. Again, we felt like uh, we could be an early adopter because um, you know, that's kind of what our system was built around, it was the population health model. Uh, so, you know, we, we felt like, you know, let's uh, get into that program early. Um, I think it's been to our advantage to, to do so. And we'll get into a little bit more detail on that. As far as hospital issues, we have, uh, we're familiar with the Springfield area. It's a very challenging demographic area. Um, difficult hair mix. Uh, our current payer mix is about 43% uh, better care, which we'd actually like to see that a little bit higher because we are cost-based reimbursed for Medicare. That's a little bit low if you look at national averages for critical access hospitals. Um, we do get paid less than our actual cost because of the uh, sequestration a couple of years ago. That's still in force, plus a lot of the allowable expenses 
we used to be able to claim, we can no longer claim. So that really isn't you know, paying our full cost. But again, it, it probably most closely gets to, to paying our full cost, certainly more so than Medicaid, which is 22% of our business. If you look at industry norms and across the state, that is extremely high. We have a very significant Medicaid population in our community that we serve. Uh, Blue Cross is about 15%. Other commercial insurance together is about 16%. So that is a, you know, if you look at it, uh, compare it to other hospitals in, in my profession, um, colleagues would say that's a very difficult thing to, to manage. Um, we do um, have the same workforce issues. Um, when I first came four years ago, you know, we've really only begun to see the workforce issues as far as the non-clinicians, physicians, um, really hit us hard last year. Our uh, turnover has begun to increase. Um, we understand that we used to be able to recruit nurses right out of school because we would accept nurses and venture to train them. Uh, whereas other tertiary hospitals at that time uh, would not take new grads, they wanted experienced nurses. So oftentimes we would train them up and then they might go to Dartmouth or UDM. Uh, now I understand that some of those hospitals because of the acute shortage are beginning to kind of waive that requirement or begin to take some new grads themselves. So that, that's had an impact on us. Um, you know, the wages, we, we try to keep up with our across the boards and we're trying to uh, do some uh, wage adjustments. Um, also, we're, we're trying to create the right kind of environment that nurses want to be a part of. Um, but our biggest workforce issue has been, particularly this past year, has been on the provider side. The paying, pay, particularly for inpatient medicine or hospitals, locum uh, coverage. We've had some acute turnover there, and that has impacted us significantly on our, on our financials. So with those factors, we did not realize the budget goals for 2018, and we'll scout a little more on that. As far as risks and opportunities, uh, I think not only in the state of Vermont so much, I think we, we have a direction, we have a, a vision in this state, but you know, I'm looking more at the federal level, what's going to happen to the Affordable Care Act, it keeps getting chipped away at. Um, you know, Vermont has stepped up and maintained uh, coverage and people will have insurance coverage. Uh, that doesn't happen everywhere. Where is the um, ACO going as far as federal policy? They just announced that they're no longer supporting um, upside risk only plans. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at what, what's going to happen on the federal level. And then again, being a federally qualified health center, we're very much in tune to what happens on, on the national level. And it does affect us uh, as well. Uh, mentioned also recruitment and retention of staff. You've heard it probably from every, uh, in every presentation the past couple of weeks. Uh, it's just a, a diff difficult to recruit, particularly in primary care. I think we've looked for two years uh, to try to find a primary care physician because in the past few years we've been pretty successful in finding uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners, but we see a number of our uh, physicians who are beginning to age out, getting closer to retirement, um, and we need to we kind of rebalance that ratio. So we are you know, getting into that difficult market of finding a primary care physician to, to work in our system. We do have a little bit of advantage. Um, there are certain positions out there that want to work in FQHC that like the mission, and those are the kind of the ones that we try to target. You know, we don't try to recruit uh, you know, ones right out of residency or big city uh, physicians. We do tend to try to focus on, on those that have a strong sense of uh, community service and uh, you know, have, have done some work in you know, low income difficult areas and want to continue that. Um, we also see consumer expectations changing rapidly, um, market disruption, competition. Uh, you know, now you can see that we're, we're focused in on primary care. 
uh, we've made a strong part of our mission to get everyone in our community tied into a primary care practice to go see their primary care practitioner on a regular basis. Now we're beginning to see that you know, people are making appointments um, and having visits through their laptop or cell phones, what have you. And you see you know, the Amazons of the world uh, beginning to get into healthcare. That could be a very, very major disruption to you know, us and our mission trying to provide a primary care home for patients. And how are we, are we having some disruption with the urgent care growth, but also these uh, visits through uh, uh, computers that people are, are doing on a national level. Um, that may be a good thing, but you know, in our model, we think it's very important that people are hooked into primary care consistently getting that uh, continuity of service in order to prevent uh, further deterioration of chronic disease, et cetera. Also, uh, as a risk and also an opportunity, uh, is the one care participation, which I mentioned, early indications, you know, again, very early indications, the first couple of months, it's been positive. Uh, again, we built our model around population health. Um, so we um, feel that that's going to benefit us in the long run. Um, we are looking at expanding uh, our urology practice. Um, we have currently have one provider who is through a contract with Dartmouth. She's there about four days a week. Currently, she wants to cut back to three days. So we were able, fortunately, to find a resident uh, who's finishing up at the uh, Dartmouth at the end of December who will join that practice. So that'd be just a little over one full-time position. And really, that's one of the only areas we have in the hospital practices that we do have wait times, and it's generally three to four months to get an appointment. Um, you know, it's not urgent, not emergent cases. So that is a growing area that we're trying to address the need. Um, you may ask, for well, is that something that could be provided through Dartmouth or referral to another facility? Well, we're 45 minutes to an hour away from any other comparable uh, hospital service or that particular specialty. And again, we have a growing elderly population that generally requires more urologic care. Um, so we're, we're trying to meet that need with a little bit of an expansion there. Um, we have had some challenges with our orthopedic program. As you may recall from the previous uh, testimony in past years, uh, we've been very stable with two orthopedic surgeons. Uh, for a couple of years, we dropped down to one. We had one practitioner that moved back over to Dartmouth. Uh, we did recruit, you know, turned out fair play, we did recruit a Dartmouth uh, physician who was the head of their trauma program. And he's now been working with us almost a year. And it took him about six months to kind of relearn the, the bread and butter orthopedics. Uh, he began being a trauma specialist, that's all he focused on. And he wanted to get back into doing the traditional knees, hips, joints. Uh, general clinic type uh, practice. So it took time for him to ramp up and kind of uh, hone his expertise again in those, uh, in those areas. So that's a, another reason why we did not hit our financial targets uh, this year. Um, we have, you know, I think we have a continuing opportunity to uh, enhance what I think is a very sound uh, mental health substance abuse service that we pro provide predominantly through our FQHC and also through the 10 additional acute inpatient psychiatric beds at the Windows Center in Rockingham. Um, so again, looking at the next slide, the access, you know, as I mentioned, our wait times are uh, minimal. We have same day visits that are available through our FQHC practices at Rockingham, Ludlow, Springfield, and Charlestown. So I, I think, you know, for a non-emergent case, you can get in to one of our practices uh, except for urology at this point, with, with that in, in order to uh, wait. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob DeMarco to, to discuss our all care model quality measures. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'll just mention, I know we've already heard the amount of discussion today, and I 
certainly uh, agree with a lot of their comments regarding the quality measures. Um, we consider quality measure extremely important for our organization. We always have. Uh, we believe that if we can't measure things, we really can't have a discussion, we can't define them. By measuring them, it helps us communicate to our patients and to all of us and our providers you know, regarding the care that we're giving so that we know what we're doing. Um, quality measurements not new to us. These measurements are not new to us. Uh, we're very pleased uh, that these measures uh, from the all-payer model uh, align with our UDS uh, measures from HRSA, as well as uh, the blueprint measures. The definitions have become uh, the same, which is great. It cuts down on the work for us to be able to uh, understand the data. Uh, we do have uh, concerns about the data that comes from blueprint and one care. At this point, uh, they're dealing with smaller populations. There's problems with data transfers. Uh, from our hospital to the state sometimes. Um, we're very confident, though, in the improvement efforts we're making uh, through the UDS data, which is pretty much the same data as the all-payer model. Uh, we actually look at our entire population, and so we feel that that data is actually a better and more accurate reflection of the work we do. Uh, we use the data every day. We talk about it frequently. We have amazing teams in our organization uh, to measure, to analyze, uh, and to focus on performance improvement. Our goal is always to educate our uh, staff uh, to the quality measures. We want to standardize how we provide care to our patients to be able to meet uh, the demands of the measures. I think all of the measures we've agreed upon as clinicians, uh, they're really important to us um, and uh, really relative to our patients in terms of good outcomes. Um, as I statement at the end there, it says, you know, quality indicators guide and focus our clinical improvement efforts toward our aim to provide patients the highest level of measurable, reliable, effective quality of care. We truly believe it's uh, is certainly very supportive of the work. Uh, that one care is providing right now. And I think even though the uh, measurements may not be totally accurate at this point, certainly the tools that are being provided to be able to focus on areas in our populations that are in particular risk in terms of utilization and quality outcomes is really important to us. And our goal as we work with One Care Vermont is to be able to apply those tools, these measurements to our entire population, not just a small uh, volume of attributed lives. Now I'll turn it over to Scott to get into our financial statements. Okay, as you know, uh, we asked for a 5% rate increase this year. Um, if you look at the uh, 19 numbers versus 18, you can see uh, inpatient is basically flat. If you took out the 5% rate increase, we're actually uh, projecting down from uh, the budget for 18 as far as buying is concerned. Outpatient, if you take out the 5%, we're about even, and I will get into uh, some of the reasons why we think outpatient is going to pick it up a little more compared to inpatient. Um, bed debt is budgeted to go up, and Jerry here to go down a little bit. Um, in total, I think they're about the same, and again, that's the same thing that uh, other people have mentioned. We think with the mandate going away starting uh, in January, some people will drop their insurance and end up in bad debt um, versus charity care. Um, <clears throat> total deductions are, are based on uh, gross income, uh, so that's not much movement there. Um, uh, other income is our adult daycare mostly, uh, 1.4 million. Uh, there's some grants in there, but it's mostly adult daycare income. Uh, Expense-wise, we are up uh, less than a million dollars. When I get into the reconciliation of 18, I will explain what the issues were and what um, steps we've been taking to control expenses. Um, <clears throat> So our bottom line from operations is pretty conservative, about uh, less than a million dollars. Um, and even last year it was pretty conservative, but we're not going to come close to it. Uh, 
Um, we're going to support the FQHC with the 250000 again. Uh, and then um, investments are probably going to have to multiply. For a total um, return, approximately $1.6 million compared to estimated for this year, $2.3 million. Uh, you might put a negative sign in front of that, and it would be a little closer to where we're going to end up. Um, the cash flow and balance sheet are in there. These are right from um, your software. I will skip over those for now. If there's questions, we can come back to them. Um, the Pyramix Index. This is our in versus out of state. Um, Medicaid, uh, for us, yeah, it pays about the same for, for hospital stuff, but for the site unit, uh, it pays about a couple hundred dollars a day less than Vermont Medicaid does. Um, private pay is a uh, pretty high percentage coming from out of state, about 35% compared to 65 in the state. Um, the others are pretty much probably in line with any board community um, in Vermont. Um, so the, the, reason, the main reason, other than volume, that we're having an issue in 18 are two expenses, which everybody I think has talked about, uh, local coverage, and I'll throw uh, travelers in there as well, and self-insurance. We really got beat up on self-insurance this year. Uh, we do have a plan moving forward, and uh, we'll mix it up. Uh, we're planning on joining uh, with the, the NIA group, which is the, the Dartmouth uh, Women Alliance for Health Purchasing Group. They also do uh, insurance, or some of the hospitals participate in self-insurance plans, so you spread the risk out, um, especially for high-cost high, high cost, um, expenses. Uh, this year, we happen to get hit with a very high cost for, for one procedure. It cost us about $600,000, which we would have avoided if we'd been in this plan. Um, other things are reduced local coverage. Uh, we're working on hiring another, or we want to hire two more uh, hospitalists. We've got one uh, we think is on the hook uh, at the moment. Um, and then we, I think, have the only fully physician anesthesia group in the state. We're going to change that mix a little and put a couple CRNAs in there. and. Uh, reduce the number of MDs that are in there, and that will save us approximately half a million dollars. Um, the local coverage itself, um, there's a variance of uh, approximately $1.4 million this year. So in the reconciliation, um, yeah, we missed revenue by 6%. Uh, Percentage-wise, most of it was on inpatient, and even though inpatient days exceed budget, it's the mix of what type of patients they are. Uh, they're mostly medical, um, less surgical, so dollars per uh, patient or per patient day are down, even though the days are, are just a little more budget. Outpatient, part of that is the OR. Um, and it just hasn't come back like we hoped it would. Contractuals and, and cherry care all follow um, pretty much the decrease in revenue. Uh, moving on to the next page is, is what tells the tale of why we're there. Uh, you've got uh, employee benefits over by 1.2 million. Physician fees, which includes locums, over by 1.4 million, and travelers over by 230,000. <coughs> we add all those up, it's about 2.88 million. If we were on budget for those, this two and a half million dollar loss would be a 300,000 dollar gain. As you can see, most other expenses are down. Uh, we're, um, some of the things we're doing is we're looking at every contract we have, no matter how big or how small. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. We looked at uh, copiers. Um, we had copiers rented or, or bought from uh, lots of different places. Well, we consolidated it all into one place, and we're saving annually $100,000 on copiers. Uh, we also looked at pagers, uh, telephones, systems. And 
those aren't anywhere near as big as that, but 10 or 20,000 bucks pretty soon adds up to some real money. Um, we're just maybe 10% of the way reviewing those contracts. Um, so we've got a long ways to go, and there's some big ones coming up that we're looking at right now. Um, so that, those are a few of the areas that we're addressing in 18 now that are, some of them are reflected in the 19 level. So cost containment is, is, is our focus, because uh, that's one thing you can control to, to some degree. And uh, that is going to be a continuous thing. Um, it has been for a few years, but now it's more of a systematic approach. Once we're done with all the contracts, we're going to go right back and fix that. Kind of like paint your gold gate bridge. Once you finish, you go back and you start at the other end. Uh, and that's our approach to these contracts. So we're trying to get away from any evergreen contracts that renew automatically. Because sometimes you miss the date to terminate and you're stuck with it for the next year, where you have one called end annually. You at least are aware that you want to renew or don't want to renew a contract. Um, and that will make us a little more efficient than we have been in the past. Uh, within our hospital system. And that's something that we've had UB 
DM as well as Dark has reached out to us and say, you know, we, we could use some help with fulfilling the need. Um, Dark has specifically did that, and we've had some training from UVM too, so our psychiatrists are going to be operating that service within our system now, um, something that can be very effective for um, ongoing uh, mental health needs, especially depression. So that's something that's worth we're, we're moving into. Um, obesity, um, you know, we have struggled with this within our primary care group, and part of the reason is you have 10 minutes to set some goals and hold people accountable when they come in. Um, that's tough, and I don't know anybody that's made life changes over 10 minutes. Um, you know, that's a difficult piece. So what we did is we thought outside of the box, and we have hired a lifestyle certified physician for lifestyle medicine. His name is Dr. Scott Durgan. He was a our physician for us years ago and that came back with the certification. It's relatively new, so if you haven't heard about it, it's not surprising. Um, it's a hard program that's been going on for a bit. Um, Scott himself is definitely taking his time with patients, and that's something you don't necessarily see in primary care because of the fever service models that tend to exist for a long time. We're getting away from that, and that's exciting. We're still not totally away from that. Scott's spending some really good time with patients and diving into what level are those folks at? How can you exercise? How can you eat better? And how can you minimize any kind of pharmaceuticals that you might be on with any adverse uh, type of reaction? So we know a lot of those side effects that do come along can cause other medication or medical issues. Um, so we try to stay away from that as much as we can. I also look at it as kind of the capstone piece of what Blueprint's been working on, so the nutrition and dietitian piece. This is a, a physician that is able to really guide that program and get people in and make huge changes in life. Um, we have seen that. We have had some breakthrough patients, and it is really, really rewarding when you have that happen. So lowering the cost by getting them off their medications, also um, focusing early on and getting them involved. That's the nice piece, and uh, bringing it further along, working with the schools. So we just uh, set up four FQHC sites in our schools, and um, that piece has really been led to by oral health, having dentistry actually move forward into the school system, so having a hygienist within the public schools, and um, now we're having a pediatrician within the schools too. So the idea is to really become as proactive as we can with delivering care, um, the wagging of the dog to the tail. So that's what we want to get away from that. We want to make sure that we are starting young. Um, we've talked about ACEs, we've heard about ACEs already today, um, making sure that you're having that impact on children, teaching people how to cook. It sounds pretty basic, it's um, pretty valuable. Teaching people how to shop and showing them where they can shop and eat more healthy at a reasonable cost and make life choices so that you're really starting to pull away and your fourth quadrant of patients that we're focusing on the comorbidities and making sure that we do everything we can to keep them healthy for as long as we can.
fully participate in one care of Vermont, Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross. Um, you know, we had, since before 2009, and certainly in 2009, when we became an integrated system, uh, we've used care coordination as an essential tool to reduce cost and provide better outcomes. We have a very active, for many years, the community health team, which has 40 to 50 different agencies represented in our local community. Uh, they meet on a regular basis, and we work together very well. We have a, um, working on trying to reduce our emergency department uh, visits. Uh, that's an area that has um, seen some reduction in the, in the past few years, maybe with the addition of walk-in availability, uh, improved access to primary care, but also I think uh, having people embedded in our emergency department that can address issues right away with folks, whether they be mental health, behavioral health issues, um, or they need to get time in with a primary care provider. That is such a big piece of what we do is that we don't want people accessing the system you know, on an episodic basis. Uh, we have about 32,000 uh, individuals in our community, which uh, we have in our primary care practices. Uh, that pretty much covers the entire population, so we have very strong um, market presence and we think we're doing a good job of getting everybody tied into a primary care provider in the community we serve. Now let's get into our capital budget. So our, our capital budget uh, sounds very similar to what you just heard half an hour ago. Um, it's uh, Pretty small budget, 1.14 million. Um, nothing exceeds or comes close to half a million, and there's no CLM projects. I have listed some of the larger items. Um, in, in past history, um, so since I've been here for 20 years, we never bought everything that's on the capital budget, and we haven't bought some things that weren't on the capital budget. Something breaks, you need to replace it, and do some horse trading. Um, Nothing here is, is uh, too exciting. There's some power sets for the OIR is one of the biggest things, 145,000. That's drills and, and things that the orthopedic surgeon would use. The other largest one is the CRM X-ray, 160,000. Um, and even in a good year, the, the largest I've ever seen our capital budget's about three million, but you have to live with, with your cash flow uh, issues. So. Uh, Nothing controversial, nothing exciting. Uh, pretty morning list, uh, and it's all routine replacement. Nothing new is coming in <coughs> on the hospital side of things. <coughs> the long range financial outlook um, the poor payer mix on the hospital side, um, we anticipate low growth, basically uh, inflation rate, I would think. Um, <coughs> What's bad for the hospital is kind of better news for the FQAC is Medicare and Medicaid actually pay pretty well and the FQAC um, pay better than Blue Cross and the commercial um, The cost containment is, is a big issue because uh, you have a, a pretty good amount of control over that. I'm fully participating with one here in Vermont. Um, this will be our second year coming up. Um, and I think we're going to get into a little more about one here in a, in a few minutes. I did put a couple of graphs in here on the, uh, <coughs> on the budget order compliance. Uh, kind of laugh now, looking back at 15, because we came in a little over, and we, we got beat up for it. <laughs> I think I would take that nowadays. <coughs> so it bounces around. A lot of it is, is dependent on the uh, cost report settlements. Um, when they took away the provider tax being allowed as an expense, that took about two and a half million dollars off the table for, for allowed expense. And that's really affected our reimbursement for Medicare um, since that ruling came out um, several years ago. Um, our actual results from operations kind of follows the, uh, the income, but it, to a more exaggerated degree. Um, <coughs> $4 million loss that you see in both uh, 14 and 17 
I mean, absolute bottom line loss. The loss from operations in 17 was really 1.7 million. Um, there was a, a negative effect on the uh, defined benefit plan that really impacted us along the line in both of those years. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about the ACO, because uh, I think we just anticipate the question um, about what we accrued for or didn't accrue for. Uh, we didn't accrue for anything in either direction, and the reason being we met with uh, one care uh, back in June, and uh, at that point, we were in a slight loss situation on the uh, fixed payment side of things, but we were in a gain situation when you look at the uh, local spend for your attributed lives. Because if you're under, you share the savings with uh, the different pairs. And even though it was June, they were only through February, so they said, don't take anything to the bank. It looks like you guys are going to do okay, but don't look anything. And we talked to our auditors, they said, if it looked like a loss, then be conservative and accrue something. If it looks like a gain, be conservative and don't accrue anything. So, and because they're so far behind, even at year end in September, they may be through May. And that's only five months of their year because they're in a calendar year. So um, we worked with our, our auditors, um, and you know they always preach to be conservative. And so that's why we haven't accrued anything. We definitely didn't accrue on the upside because they that could disappear in a flash. Even though we've gotten through flu season, which is when you think a lot of your expenses will be incurred, because it's kind of the year, we'll be at the beginning of flu season again in November, December, to pick up the other side of it. Um, so right now, we think we're in a uh, positive situation, but is it uh, enough to take to the bank? Well, no, so we're, we're not looking at anything. And we don't think we're going to be in a negative situation, so we can accrue uh, any reserves for that. Okay, that concludes our presentation. We'd like to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Tim. We'll start with uh, Robin Munch. Could you speak a little bit to, uh, uh, I know this is not a huge driver in your budget given uh, your percentage of Medicare and Medicaid, but could you speak a little bit to the, the your commercial contracts and um, how much are sort of a percentage of fee schedule versus percentage of charges and where uh, sort of the range is for you, just to give us a sense of that? Uh, similar to what uh, Madam Scott said, uh, we had a lot of um, fee schedules for almost all the imaging and for the lab. Um, I'll talk about Blue Cross because they're, everybody's familiar with Blue Cross. Uh, they, their discount is about 15% from charges, so we'll collect around 85% from them. Um, the uh, issue we have being a border hospital is some New Hampshire insurance companies don't like to pay a Vermont hospital, and uh, sometimes you find that out before you treat them, and sometimes you find out when you submit the bill. Um, that's an issue because then you get zero. Um, uh, and some uh, people come a long ways to our hospital, and it's a one or two off, and you, you wouldn't sign up with them, or they won't let you sign up with them anyways. Um, we've had actually that issue with our, our vision plan. They wanted to drop everybody in Vermont, but we talked to them to let them allow our uh, vision, um, our ophthalmologist, to, to be in their plan. Um, but that was a fight a month for four or five months. Uh, so that, that's a little bit of an issue, um, especially now that we're, we're getting more and more into New Hampshire. Uh, that new FQHC site is, is attracting more people from New Hampshire than more labs or x-rays or whatever. And generally, they come to us and not go up the road to Valley. Um, so anyway, short answer, 85% from Blue Cross, a little less from everybody else. Thank you. I don't have any questions. 
try to get this close. I've been told that you can't hear me from time to time. Um, so uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, uh, when um, this budget uh, project is over, um, I will be uh, calling you and we'll come down and visit your facility and, and spend an afternoon or a day there getting to know you better. Um, I have just <clears throat> two or three questions. I, I noticed in terms of your expectation, your written, the, the application of your of, uh, requested rate increase, that you, unlike most other, unlike most other hospitals, expect some additional revenue from the rate um, itself uh, in Medicaid. And uh, I'm just wondering what your thinking was behind that. I, I, I sense that most hospitals don't expect the fact that they have a <coughs> Have a I'm sorry, don't expect, I, did, I missed a word there, sorry. Okay. Um, most hospitals don't expect the fact. Uh, most hospitals don't expect uh, a revenue increase associated with the rate increase. Um, we, we've met with uh, Mike Costa a few times, and he is very interested in us keeping our childbirth center open. Um, if you are down in our area of the state, Mount Stuffy doesn't deliver, Grace doesn't deliver, Valley doesn't deliver, New London doesn't deliver, and the PD doesn't deliver. So uh, he and uh, we and him are working on a plan to uh, keep some babies from going to the NICU at Dartmouth or getting them back sooner, because he says every baby that goes there costs on average $100,000 for Medicaid. And so he's planning on giving us some extra Medicaid money from the Child Birth Center to, to make some things happen. Uh, we haven't worked out all the details yet, but that's where we're headed. And so, so you booked that uh, expected or hoped for revenue of 174000 the and associated with the rate increase? Um, I didn't know where else to put it other than the rate increase because it's not a volume thing per se is trying to avoid sending people somewhere. Um, on bad debt, again, I think you're probably going against the trend in that looking at 2019 over 2018 uh, projected, uh, which is the, the more recent number, you're expecting your bad debt to go down in 2019. Um, and you know, with other hospitals, the concern is about the individual mandate. Um, I'm just wondering what your thinking was behind that. Uh, uh, the budget, I, I show it going up 500000 on that budget. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the 2018 projected, you have um, a bad debt at $5,010,000. Uh, and for 2019 budget, you have it at $4,674,000. Um, well, I, I think our thinking was the bad debt for this year, the beginning of the year, it's always a high number because everybody's working through their, um, through their deductibles of 5,000 or whatever it is. And towards the end of the year, it tails off, so I might have been projected a little higher than uh, they should have been just annualized where we were instead of factoring in that people have through their deductibles and expected to, to have insurance picked up. I can probably answer this question myself, but I just, uh, I'll ask it anyhow. I, uh, the question is, um, do you do use a collection agency to collect your bad debt? But um, the question is, uh, do, do you, when a, a bad a debt is not collectible, do you send that information to a credit rating agency? And I, I, I know that, you know, I, I'm quoting you, I know from your, a presentation you said we select the softest approach offered so <laughs> my guess is that you don't well actually we do um, our softest approach is a couple letters and maybe a phone call not not like a credit card company that won't let you go um, and we do reverse it if people could call us and say i'll make a payment plan or, or mm -hmm. i'll pay you know we'll give them a discount for cash if they pay it and we remove it from their credit report so that if you want to buy a house or car or whatever, that's usually what gets them to 
to come to the table. And finally, how would you characterize your uh, relationship with um, the Vermont insurance companies in terms of uh, negotiating reimbursement rate? Not bad, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I think, you know, in the past, before I came to uh, the hospital, I had heard that for several years that uh, Springfield Hospital did not raise rates back in the days, I think, before the Green Mountain Care Board was active in controlling rates. And so that kind of set us behind on, on our charges in a lot of areas. Uh, I think Scott has you know, been there for 30 years, so he could probably speak to that. Yeah. Uh, Hindsight in 2020, we shouldn't have done it. We went six years without a rate increase. And you missed the compounding factor on that. And uh, even if we'd done 1%, we'd probably be in a lot different position than we are now. Um, we thought we were doing the right thing. And I remember the seventh year, we asked for a 6% rate increase. Well, they forgot we asked for zero for the prior six years and chewed our hands off. But, uh, you know, that's you know, water under the bridge, but I, I wouldn't do it again. Uh, first, thanks for answering the ACO question that you anticipated. Um, I really just want to talk a little bit about your financial model, because it's not really sustainable with the losses you've had in 17, and the new losses you're projecting now in 18, which um, you're already in for about $2 million. And, when we went through the actuals, you know, we, we looked at rebasing some of the budgets, and you know, we, we rebased obviously some of the ones that were higher. But the concern on some of the ones that are lower is, and you guys really resisted being rebased, but you're coming in to date seven percent below now in 2018. You're only asking for a one percent increase year over year on your budget, but on your actuals, it's going to be up more like seven percent, and. I'm just concerned that we're going to be in the same place. Last year, I challenged your estimates on where you were going to be for the top line, and you didn't hit them. And I'm just concerned that the same thing is going to happen, that you have some optimism still in your top line estimates that you have now for 19. And if you don't hit them, you're not able to react quickly enough on your expenses, and your loss continues to be a big loss. So it's, it's really more just a you know, concern for what your financials look like, how they were in 17, how they're now tracking in 18, and the potential that 19 could go the same way if you still have optimism in that top number. And I understand you're replacing some people and you think you're gonna get that top line. That's what we heard last year too. Um, so it's just a tough one. It's like, you know, how can we help you because it, it's not sustainable to continue at losing, you know, two to four million dollars a year, and you just don't have that much on the margin. So, I yeah, certainly agree with that. That uh, you, uh, yeah, we can't sustain these kind of losses continually. Um, we, as I mentioned before, we, we think we we have a, we have a thirty percent um, below budget on our orthopedic cases. Um, that was due, as I mentioned, we, had, we finally got our second orthopedic surgeon. The demand is there. It's just they started going somewhere else. Was, um, or they were choosing not to have uh, elective procedures, maybe due to insurance, code deductibles, et cetera. Um, and I think you've heard testimony from other hospitals, particularly critical access hospitals, that one or two providers can make a huge difference on your revenue. Um, that's certainly been our case. Um, so we do have where we, we project the need for two orthopedic surgeons. It's a very strong orthopedic program. As the population ages, there's more need for orthopedic services. And also being part of an ACO population health, I think it behooves us in the ACO to have those services provided locally in a lower cost uh, institution rather than People will give it to Dartmouth is the next closest facility, which, because they're tertiary hospitals, is going to have a higher cost structure. So, um, you know, we're, um, I think, conservatively optimistic. 
sort of, I don't believe in just pie in the sky that, you know, we're going to get back to where we were before. So I think our budget shows uh, some increase, but, but it's not uh, more, uh, overly optimistic. Similarly, with urology, we're seeing an unmet need there. That is our one area that there are we know people are either waiting a long time, or if they wait a long time, they may be going to a doctor. Um, again, at a higher cost, which is going to cost us through the ACO. So we're trying to meet those needs in specialty areas. Um, and we, we, again, I think our budget shows that it is, it is cautiously optimistic. And no, we can't sustain, sustain these kinds of losses continually. Um, if this continues, we'll have to look at those programs. Do we need two orthopedic surgeons? Can we, um, can we find a way to support one and a half, share with other organizations, et cetera? One very fragile program, as you, we, Scott mentioned, is, is the obstetrics program. We're kind of uh, bucking the trend of smaller rural critical access hospitals in making a strong effort to try and maintain and actually grow and improve that service. Uh, recently, I think it was announced that we were one of the first um, places in Vermont to, to have a um, station where my mothers can come and express milk and, and store it and share it. Uh, so we're, we're putting a lot of effort into maternal and child health. I think that, uh, as I mentioned, I think last year, we had a significant problem with uh, addicted mothers. Uh, nearly half, 40% of our mothers that deliver in our organization uh, have an addiction issue. And we, uh, we uh, are working hard to uh, reduce those numbers. And I hate to think from a population health standpoint, if we had to get out of that service because of the high cost and the low reimbursement, uh, you know, what a detrimental effect that would have. Um, not only on the ACO and the population, but uh, the, the people themselves and the community. So, you know, hopefully we won't have to get into those hard decisions of what programs do we cut or eliminate, as many hospitals around us have had to do. So again, I think the answer to your direct question is certainly these are, these are uh, you think, are reasonable and attainable goals. But if they don't, we'll have to look at other areas um, for programmatic cuts. There's also a, um, the cost report effect. And like other people have said, uh, if you're in the ACL, you, normally by now I'd have a pretty good idea of where I'd be on the cost report. I have no idea because the PSNRs are a total mess, so I can't even estimate it. But that can explain one or two million dollars one way or the other. Uh, and it has for us in the past. And with revenue and volume being down and expenses being up, I would expect some kind of pickup there, but I couldn't give you a legitimate estimate on what that's going to be. Thanks. Um, so I'll just actually just echo some of Maureen's concerns without going into detail, but I am a little worried about your optimism in the top line and whether your expenses are aligned with that optimism or whether it's in some ways fictitious NPR hopes and to some degree, fictitiously high expenses um, and not sustainable. And the ask, you know, the rate ask last year was six and a half percent. The rate ask this year is five percent. I appreciate that there was no rate ask for a while, but these again, excuse me, these again are not sustainable rate requests. Um, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I was going to mention that you know, going back to our payer mix, you know, a, a rate increase. 1% for us is vastly different what it nets our bottom line than Rutland or UVA because we have such a high percentage of Medicaid. So, you know, uh, it's a, I think Scott has the number of what a 1% rate increase actually nets us to the bottom line, which is very important. And I, I do appreciate that. Um, the other, so I struggle a little bit particularly in smaller rural hospital areas, with this tension between increasing access, which I think is admirable, um, particularly with primary care, incredibly admirable, when it starts to get into specialty care practices. I think there's a tension, there's a trade-off between everybody would love to have every specialty service in their backyard so they don't have to go very far to receive that care. The trade-off to me, as I think about it, is 
you know, what is the quality of that care that's going to deliver to the extent that there's, a, are there enough, I'll take orthopedics as an example, are there enough knee replacements and hip replacements in that area so that the providers have the experience to be providing the highest quality care with the enough procedures? Um, and similarly, we're seeing, as an example of orthopedics, the supply costs are very high. And, you know, small rural hospital is not benefiting from bulk purchasing of supplies. Now, I'm, I'm hopeful that this NIA is purchasing arrangement is going to help in that regard. But I see that trade off. And I'm wondering, as you're thinking about adding specialty practices or expanding specialty lines and service lines, given, you know, some of the financial difficulties as a hospital you have faced, how do you make that trade off? Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a challenge. You're right. Um, Oftentimes, what a smaller hospital needs, like I mentioned with orthopedics, you know, the volume may be there for 1.5, but try to find a 0.5 orthopedic surgeon. It's hard to do. Um, you know, we um, sort of think that the need has been proven in the past to be there. You look at the population numbers, it should generate X number of procedures. Um, yeah, my personal philosophy has been throughout my entire career, not just with Springfield, but you know, if we can't do a, a high quality job of services we provide, we need to find a better way for them to get that service somewhere else um, to provide ourselves. But, um, you know, I think, you know, we don't look at expanding into new service lines particularly, um, particularly into specialty areas. For example, this past year we were able to negotiate with uh, Cheshire Hospital, uh, our lithium affiliate. Um, you know, I felt like our cardiology services were woefully inadequate. inadequate. We had one cardiologist that would come meeting once or twice a month from Dartmouth, and we were able to have this uh, cardiologist come from Keene once a week. Um, didn't cost the hospital anything. They, they paid. Um, they would do the charges themselves. And you know, we did get some in increase in ancillary business for diagnostics. But the bottom line is, you know, people got care that they otherwise wouldn't have got. They would have seen a cardiologist and you know, potentially they would have had more um, problems down the road that would have required more expensive episodic care. So that's an example of a program that's working to so win for them, to so win for us. And it's a win for the community. Um, so we're looking at creative ways to provide some new services. Um, and you're, you're right, it's, it's what's that sweet spot? What can you provide by high quality and low cost? For example, if all of our orthopedic patients from our community uh, had to suddenly go to Dartmouth because we back down on our orthopedic program, you know, I would dare say I don't have the statistics in front of me, but the cost would be much higher because the, the cost structure of the church here in hospitals could be much higher than our facility. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And uh, we're in a, in a high need community. We are in our, an hour, to an hour and a half away from another uh, hospital with similar capabilities. And we're beginning to feel that when we see others around us starting to eliminate programs and services. I think the pressure's on for us to, to find creative uh, financially feasible ways to continue to provide services in our community. You mentioned um, your statistic about maternal, uh, you know, the, the percentage of your mothers that are giving birth to a different babies, uh, or different mothers giving birth to babies, is 40 to 50 percent. I have to tell you, of, of all the hospital budget hearings from last year, they all mushed together, they all went together. That is the one statistic that I thought about that's kept me up at night, literally, this, this year. Um, when I think about what are we doing, are we doing enough? So my question to you is, what have you done in the past year, specifically with that specific statistic, and have you seen any inroads in reducing the percentage of mothers giving birth? Yeah, we, we have seen a somewhat of a reduction, I think, um, of those that we bring in. Uh, getting into statistics I don't have right in front of me, but I think um, roughly a third of those mothers that are having an issue once confronted, they do make an effort to try to get off during their pregnancy at least. We try to get them into programs. Um, I can go back and 
get some specific information uh, for you know, for, for numbers off the top. Was last year. Um, yeah, I will, I will. I can get you those numbers. I don't want to speak. Okay, that's fine. But we have our, you know, well, it was all on my list of questions because it did yeah. stay with me for the entire Sure, it stayed with us, and that's why we so strongly are trying to improve our maternal child health program and maintain uh, obstetrics in that community because it's a very easy target, as you've seen around this. Uh, for hospitals to just cover because of the high expense of the reimbursement. Uh, my, my guess would be that the number is so troubling and so high that granting agencies would be willing to grant innovative ways to reduce that. Yeah, and we're also looking at, you know, of course, as Scott mentioned, trying to work with Mike Costin to reduce, you know, I think we have the capability and the capacity without adding cost to perhaps get those babies that are born prematurely and have to go up to Darwin to deliver. <laughs> After maybe a couple of days or a week or two, they can come back to our facility and we can continue to allow them to feed and grow until they're capable of being discharged. Again, in a lower cost structure environment, closer to home, because it not only saves cost for the healthcare system, but also those individual families who have to make that daily trip to, to Darwin. 100 miles round trip. But I think, you know, it's a little I just want to add a little bit to that. Um, there is a lot of hope, and so I can appreciate you not sleeping at night over that statistic. We didn't either. Um, we have since we had testified last year the licensed independent clinical social worker in the Women's Health Center, which is our application of obstetrics unit. And they work very closely with the nurse practitioners and psychiatrists around addiction that within that women's center who also do a majority of the outpatient care for the FQHC. They actually round on the unit too. And so they're in direct communication with the social worker that's taking place in the outpatient visits of the OBG Biden Clinic. And that's a handoff to the nurse practitioner if we need to have some sort of level of intervention as well as even in addition if we needed to. Uh, so there's actively work that's gone on with that, and some of that is grandfathered to the state of Vermont. So there is, um, there is a huge amount of resources going into that right now. It's our hopes that when we come next year that we have even less of that going on. Um, the last question is about self assured I've asked for all the hospitals, but I see it with the next driver on your books and um, asking about whether you have thoughts about attributing those lives, working with you know your carrier to uh, attribute those lives to one carrier. And it sounds like you're moving to joining me and may change some of that dynamic for you. And I'm wondering, does that preclude you from attributing your employees' lives to one carrier? Uh, we kind of, uh, our plan is designed to encourage people to use our services to deductibles and co-pays, et cetera. Um, the issue is, is only people that see a physician can be attributed, and we're very heavy at mid level, so if I was going to concentrate my efforts anywhere, I'd be in. Commits Medicare to allow mid levels in because they won't see why they're not. If they did, it would triple our number of attributed lives. Um, so until that part is done, I don't know that we would gain much by moving our people over because we're not able to see physicians. Because we don't have any physicians, we don't see the middle. Okay, thank you. Can you share with us uh, your experiences as being um, at full risk with an ACO um, over the past year? What has pleased you? What has displeased you? Uh, well, I like the, the, the monthly payments. Third Friday every month, I can count on that showing up, which is a big improvement over some of our other pairs. Uh, this, the quality stuff, I have to let Bob answer, but uh, it's been pretty painless. Uh, after the, there were some hiccups at the beginning, and Medicare was not prepared to, to go with it, so there were no payments until February. Medicaid has been on the ball the whole time. Blue Cross um, is not doing the monthly payments. They're still doing fee for service. I don't know when they're going to switch over, if, if ever. For the FQHC, it really helped out. It was a pickup of about a half million dollars um, due to some commemorative per month payments on the FQHC side of things. Uh, so that was a nice pickup. Um, I get along great with, with Tom Tom. Uh, 
this block and weigh in on the quality stuff. Uh, it's actually really a little bit too early on the quality measures, but uh, I expect they're going to do well with those quality measures, they will, and they will uh, continue to help our favorite model. Um, you know, feel confident that we'll do well because we've had so much experience with this in our, actually really our model of care with the hospital and community health center working together um, really supports doing well with those measures. So if your colleagues at Gifford, for example, was somewhat similar situated, came to you and said, we're considering running uh, one year, what, what would you say to them? Well, in fact, you know, we did attend their last board meeting, Scott and I, uh, and they, they spent about an hour uh, discussing uh, that very topic, we were first on the agenda. Um, you know, I think we were very straight. I said, you know, it's, it's not something that you're, um, from a business perspective, you're not going to see a definitive business plan. You know, this is what you're going to get at the end of it. This is the expense and, and benefit. Some of it is just a leap of faith. Uh, do you have the infrastructure in place? Are you ready to do this? Uh, you know, if a hospital is a great you know, fee-for-service style of, of operation, and you're not ready, I would definitely say not. Um, but them being similar to us, being an FQAC in a hospital, I think you know, the benefits that uh, financially right out of the gate that you get, the improved cash flow, and the payments per member per month payments being an FQAC providing primary care, um, you know, I think it's overall been beneficial. The early results are encouraging. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, uh, didn't give a recommendation, yes, you want to join, no, you shouldn't, but, you know, pretty much laid out the facts. And, you know, personally, I'm, I'm on the uh, board of One Care Vermont, on the executive committee, and I can say they have listened to my concerns raised. I feel I'm a representative of critical access hospitals and the FQACs uh, providing primary care. And I think they've listened and responded appropriately. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, just a couple. Uh, just two questions. Thank you for your presentation for working with our staff. Um, I noticed in your narrative that your average daily census for the Wyndham Center is um, about 6.8, just under um, 7. And um, there are 10 beds there. and. Um, yet there are also some significant wait times um, in your ED for mental health patients. And I'm wondering if that's related to, are you getting a lot of level one patients in your ED, or is there some other factor there? That is part of the issue, is level ones. And another part is uh, you get some people with more than one issue. Um, we have a lot of uh, dementia patients that need a long-term solution, not, the, not our psych unit. Uh, and once in a while we have somebody that comes in and they need a guardian and there's no family member around. So we have, to, especially if they're from New Hampshire, it takes a lot longer to become the guardian so you can place them somewhere. Vermont, it's a little bit quicker. Um, but the, and the psych unit in the last three or four months has picked it up substantially. It is running around nine uh, pretty consistently now. Thank you. And then the only other question was um, I noticed that um, for your private pay segment, um, that's where your highest out of state um, uh, uh, patients are. And wondering if, um, you know, what are the drivers of that? Um, does that increase your uncompensated care um, in any way? Just wondering what, what happens there. Well, it is 35%, but it's 35% of a 4%. So it's yeah. a pretty small number. Uh, I think it is because the, uh, the new FQHC site that was built over in Charlestown is attracting more people. And then uh, the FQHC will say, well, we'll get lab test x-rays or whatever. Uh, so I think it's that's what's drawing some more New Hampshire people than we had in the past. So you've seen that increase from say last year or the year before? Okay. Yes. Great, thank you. 
So at this point, we'll turn the question over to Julie Shaw from the Healthcare Advocates Office. Thank you. I just have one question. Um, I'm wondering if you consider the commercial pre, uh, rate approved by the board in your budget order to be a set rate or a starting point for negotiations with the commercial insurers. Well, the bills will go out with that 5% increase. Um, Blue Cross last year did not come back to us and ask for a bigger discount. This year they did for a little bit, and they agreed to it because the average last year and this year wasn't much of a change at all. I haven't heard much from anybody else. Usually they wait and see what was approved, and then they start negotiating. Um, and there aren't many that negotiate because Blue Cross is the majority of the business in our area. Uh, and like I said, the New Hampshire ones, we're lucky if they even allow us to build. Uh, so the, the short answer, Blue Cross, yes, there was a little bit of a discount, and the others would still need to determine. Thank you. At this point, we'll open it up to the public for any public comment on the Springfield budget. And I'm not seeing anyone come forward. So, uh, Tim, we thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to take a, a brief five-minute break.